The Gothic style lasted a long time in England, even into the 16th century. And in the 19th century, the English Gothic revival was an extremely popular style. For example, uh, the Houses of Parliament in London are not true medieval Gothic, they are Gothic revival of the 19th century. So the English love their Gothic style. Uh, of course, originally it wasn't called Gothic, uh, it was the French style. And uh, English Gothic was very much influenced by French Gothic. Uh, at first, the English Gothic churches were simpler and less vertical than French Gothic. Then the love of purely ornamental ribbing and tracery was pushed to its limits, resulting in richly ornamental decorative vaulting. Now, in England, the French style, what we call Gothic, was adapted to local tastes. English Gothic churches are usually lower, with more horizontal elements than the French Gothic. And the English placed emphasis on decoration over structure, including, at some time, uh, Gothic timber roofs with intricate patterns of decorative ribbing. In England, the French style, what we call Gothic, was adapted to local tastes. The English Gothic churches are usually lower, with more horizontal elements than French Gothic. Because their churches are lower in height, the English frequently do not use flying buttresses. Often, English churches have square apses. Now, this is the influence of Cistercian art. Um, rectangular plans with square apses were frequent in Cistercian monastic buildings. And the Cistercian influence reinforced Norman, of course the Normans conquered England, uh, the Norman preferences for rectangular plans, fine masonry vaults, and geometric or foliate decoration. And monasticism was extremely important in England before the Protestant Reformation when Henry VIII dissolved and pillaged the monasteries. The English placed emphasis on decoration over structure, including Gothic timber roofs with intricate patterns in decorative ribbing. And here you see an example uh, from Ely Cathedral where the crossing dome is actually uh, made out of wood uh, with uh, all of these decorative uh, intricate ribs forming a kind of star pattern. The English had a long tradition of woodworking, going back to Anglo-Saxon and even Viking roots. Except for Salisbury Cathedral, most English churches are not as unified as the French, and you'll often find that different sections of the English churches are all built at different times. Uh, so you have an earlier and a later Gothic style sort of um, added on. Often, English churches have large pointed windows on the west facade rather than the circular rose windows that you find in uh, France. They have different names for the English Gothic styles or the English Gothic periods, um, but they correspond approximately to what, early Gothic, high Gothic, and late Gothic, although they're called something uh, slightly different. And they're always just a little bit later in, uh, in England because, of course, the Gothic originated in France around uh, 1140, uh, the mid-12th centuries, and uh, then spread. So uh, we see the earliest Gothic churches are generally late 12th centuries. So the early Gothic, also known as the Lancet Gothic in uh, England, uh, would be dating then from the late 12th to the mid 13th centuries, around 1180-ish <laughs> to 1250-ish. Uh, then we have what we call the decorated style. Uh, this would be about the mid 13th to the mid 14th centuries. And it has subdivisions, uh, which will be called the geometric and the curvilinear periods. Uh, I don't think you have to worry about those uh, subdivisions as much, uh, for this class anyway. Uh, 
Uh, and then the late Gothic style in, uh, in England is called the Perpendicular style, sometimes called uh, a rectilinear style or the late Gothic style. Um, and this was from the mid-14th to the mid-16th centuries. So Gothic lasted a long time in England, and then come the 19th century, they revived it. Uh, they do love their Gothic. The first English Gothic church we're going to talk about is Canterbury Cathedral. And the Gothic church was founded about 1175. But first I want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of Canterbury Cathedral because of course the Gothic church uh, is built on the site of earlier churches and the church has a long history. Uh, Canterbury uh, Cathedral was founded in 597 when Pope Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine, uh, this is St. Augustine of Canterbury, not St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, sent St. Augustine of Canterbury uh, to convert the Anglos of Britain to Christianity. Uh, the cathedral was rebuilt by the Normans in 1070 after a fire. And you will remember that uh, the Norman style is what the English call Romanesque. So when you talk about uh, uh, Norman style in England, you're talking about the Romanesque period. You're probably familiar with the Canterbury Tales. And you know that uh, the cathedral became a major site of pilgrimage after Archbishop Thomas Becket was murdered in the cathedral in 1170 and was rather quickly canonized in 1173. Uh, and of course, it became a site of pilgrimage for centuries, right up until um, the Reformation. In 1174, a disastrous fire destroyed that cathedral. So now, they're going to rebuild it in the new Gothic style. So around 1175, the Gothic Cathedral of Can Canterbury was begun. The architect and master was a Frenchman, William of Sens, who died from a fall from the scaffolding in 1178. The new choir of Canterbury Cathedral resembles and was influenced by the early French Gothic style of Sens Cathedral, which of course William of Sens would have been uh, quite familiar with. This introduced the, uh, to England the French style of pointed arches and clustered or compound piers. Uh, the be building continued under William, uh, a different William, uh, it's William the Englishman, they call him, uh, to distinguish him from William of Sens, his French predecessor. And the uh, early Gothic building campaign continued from 1175 to 1184. This included uh, the eastern part of the present building, the large choir, and the Trinity and Corona chapels. The Chronicle of Gervaise of Canterbury, who witnessed the building, tells us of William of Sens, his unfortunate end, and his new building techniques. William introduced a new vaulting technique to England. Vaults were constructed with ribs and keystones and supported by tall, slender shafts connected to the piers of the nave arcade. Gothic unity, or the fusion of parts, was a new way of building. Dark Purbeck stone English stone was used for the shafts and for other decorative accents. The nave elevation had three levels, the arcade, a gallery rather than a triforium, so it's larger than a triforium, people can walk around on that second level, and a clare story. This resembles early French Gothic churches like Sens, rather than the French High Gothic elevation of Arcade, Triforium, and Clerestory. Uh, you can see here how Sens Cathedral 
influenced Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, you have your pointed arches uh, uh, and uh, a gallery, and then the clerestory above. Uh, there certainly are some differences. Uh, that, that contrast of the dark stone at Canterbury, for example, uh, sets up an interesting decorative aspect. And as you can see, the uh, dark colonnette rises to the capitals of the nave arcade. And then there's a kind of break uh, with a new base uh, of the colonnette rising up again. But we often say that the uh, English Gothic churches are uh, not as high, uh, they're lower, and they have more horizontal elements. You can read the, the, uh, the gallery as a large you know, sort of horizontal band uh, throughout the building. And here we're comparing uh, the Sens vault the sexpartite vault at uh, the early Gothic French church of Sens with the, the vaulting at Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, they're both sexpartite vaults or six-part vaults with the uh, transverse arch coming uh, straight across the nave, rising from the springing of the vault. And uh, that forms the edge, uh, the uh, boundaries of the bay. And then they are crisscrossed. Uh, with decorative ribs, uh, not just uh, the two ribs uh, crossing diagonally that would make a quadripartite vault, but also in the middle. So you have six sections, six of these uh, sort of concave triangular sections uh, uh, in each bay. In the 14th century, the vault was extended into the space of the West End using the late Gothic style known as the perpendicular style. This was between 1377 and 1405, the late 14th century into the very early 15th century. Now, the perpendicular style features, as you can see, uh, tall vertical supports and a decorative Lernay vault. And let's take a closer look at the vault. Uh, you can see that you have all of these uh, multiple ribs uh, rising from the springing of the vault, from the uh, capitals here. And then within it are these shorter ribs uh, that form decorative pattern. So Lernay are the extra ribs between the other ribs and the boss. And they form a decorative pattern it's characteristic of the perpendicular style, and it exemplifies the English love of pattern and decoration. Slightly later, we have uh, Lincoln Cathedral, which was begun uh, less than 20 years later, uh, in 1192. Um, the dedication at Lincoln is St. Mary's, so it is a church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. It was commissioned by Archbishop Hugh of Avalon, and the architect and master mason was Geoffrey of Nures. When you look at the facade of Lincoln Cathedral, uh, you'll see basically a screen of blind arches uh, just going completely across the, the surface. You'll remember blind arches are arches with wall behind them. And this really masks the interior. Uh, it is a, a kind of uh, screen. And it also has these very strong horizontal elements. Uh, each row of, uh, of the arcades uh, forms a kind of horizontal band. The walls also are quite heavy. You're not seeing a lot of perforations there. And uh, you don't have uh, flying buttresses at this church. All of which exemplifies uh, the English preference for uh, horizontal elements uh, rather than just overwhelming verticality. You have vertical elements too. You, know, you have your pointed arches, for example, and you can see that uh, the facade has this very, very tall uh, pointed uh, recess uh, above the entrance door. Um, but still, you have the strong horizontal uh, aspect of this church. The plan is cruciform or cross-shaped. 
Uh, and as you can see, it has a number of cross pieces. It actually has double transepts, in other words, two transepts uh, rather than just one. And here you see the square east end, the square choir that we talked about uh, that was typical of many uh, English churches. You have a rib ridge, which you saw uh, at uh, Canterbury, that goes down the length of the church. And then tressarian vaults, and these are the ribs that spring from the shaft or the pier to the rib cage. Uh, and that is uh, in the nave and in the eastern choir. And then you have something that's really interesting, it's called the crazy vaults. And those are in what is known as St. Hugh's Choir, which is further east. Uh, and that is uh, the part of the nave that is uh, between the transepts, essentially. Uh, it was designed in 1192 and then rebuilt uh, in 1239. So now we've looked at a plan. Let's look at it uh, in the actual architecture. These are those crazy vaults we talked about. Uh, why are they crazy? Well, because they've got uneven spacing between the uh, tercerion ribs, the tercerion ribs. And you can see these ribs spring from the uh, springing of the vault and they rise up to a rib ridge, a uh, ridge, a rib that just goes horizontally down the nave right at the uh, top of the vault. And the springing is irregular. And so it's, it's crazy. <laughs> and it divides the ceiling into irregular shapes rather than quadripartite or sexpartite. Uh, uh, and it's, it's lively, it's fun, it's decorative. And here's a closer detail of, of one of those vaults. They divide the ceiling into irregular and intricate shapes. And this is part of the style that's called the decorated style, or sometimes the curvilinear style. Uh, this begins an experimental phase of English architecture, where you have lighter construction and increased ornamentation. If we look at the lower wall of the transept uh, in St. Hugh's Choir, we see a new kind of arcading, which once again is very decorative. You have blind arc a blind arcade, and then you have the arcade with the trefoil arches, and this refers to the three curving shapes at the top. And they overlap pointed arches giving uh, what movement, richness, uh, more three-dimensional quality. Uh, it's, uh, they call it syncopated arcading. It's um, very decorative. And now we want to talk about Salisbury Cathedral, built between 1220 and 1258. So you can see that uh, most of the church, I mean, there are certainly additions, but most of the church uh, was put up in a single, rather short, building campaign. And this means that it is the uh, it is probably the most unified of all of these churches. Uh, we've uh, looked at uh, Canterbury and uh, Lincoln, and we've seen how uh, you know, they add on sections. Uh, here we have a very unified uh, church, which uh, contains a number of the characteristics that we do associate with the English Gothic. This is also dedicated to Mary, so it is St. Mary's Cathedral at Salisbury. Uh, the spire is a bit later. The spire is from the 14th century, about uh, 1320 to 30. And the architect of the cathedral is known. Uh, he is Master Nicholas of Eli. Uh, the uh, original patron was the bishop, who was Richard Poor. And this is considered to be an excellent example of the early Gothic style known as the Lancet style. Uh, as we said, it was built in a unified building campaign uh, with a few later additions. The 14th century edition of the crossing uh, tower and spire in the center, which goes up to uh, 404 feet. When we look at the west facade, once again, you have this feeling of a screen, a series of arches uh, in uh, 
different layers and tiers going up the surface. And when you look at the plan, it's rectilinear. You have the rectangular apse and uh, all of the other parts of the building. Uh, this is uh, probably the Cistercian influence. Uh, Cistercian influence may have been also inspired the double transepts. And of course, that uh, square chapel uh, at the eastern end is the projecting Lady Chapel, uh, dedicated to Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. Now, English cathedrals, unlike French, are not usually in the towns. Usually a French cathedral is associated with the, the town that it is in, Chartres, Rams, whatever. Um, but English cathedrals are very often connected to an abbey. Uh, so there is need for more room, uh, an extra transept here, a long choir, because, of course, as you remember, the monks uh, will be going to the canonical offices uh, eight times during the day and night. Uh, some of the monks are also priests, and they have to uh, say Mass every day. So they need extra space. Now, the height of this, by French standards, is, is quite low. And that, once again, is uh, an English characteristic. The walls, relative to an English church, are massive. They're much thicker. Uh, that helps the uh, support of the ribbed vault with no flying buttresses. And the windows, uh, the windows which we'll be looking at shortly, it's a little hard to see them in this picture. Uh, the windows are what we call lancet windows. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. In the interior, you see the pointed arches. Uh, the tripartite elevation, where you have your side aisles, which are essentially, they're the same height as the nave. They're not, the side aisles are not lower. Um, and you have one arched opening from the floor to the ceiling. And the columns rise to the springing of the vault. With the ribs springing from the top of the column to this center of the ribbed vault. Within the church, we have the pointed arches and a tripartite elevation, which I think you can see better in the detail. Uh, you have the arcade, the gallery, and then the clear story. Remember, we have a gallery rather than a triforium, which in and of itself makes a very strong horizontal band going down the church. So you do have vertical elements, certainly, uh, pointed arches, uh, pointed vaults, uh, and yet there's still that emphasis on the horizontal elements, uh, the band of the gallery, uh, this very strong string course or um, molding that goes down the length of the nave right under the gallery. And so you have this almost this uh, horizontal line uh, pointing clear across the, clear down the nave. Uh, and then if you look at the uh, wall and you look at the compound piers, uh, there's no colonnettes that rise all the way from the floor to the vaulting. Uh, on the arcade level, the spandrels, that's the uh, sort of uh, what kind of curving triangle between the vaults, uh, the spandrels have no shafts, no colonnettes, no vertical elements there. So once again, uh, the emphasis becomes uh, horizontal as well as, as I've said, the, the verticality of the pointed arches. Uh, but there's uh, a much more... Um, but kind of equalization, or more horizontal than the than the French Gothic. At the east end of the church is the Lady Chapel, uh, dedicated, of course, to the Virgin Mary. Uh, this was uh, created between 1220 and 1225, and it's a miniature hall church. Remember that the hall church is a church uh, that simply has an arcade that goes completely up to the vaulting. 
Yeah, there's no uh, 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 division into a triforium or a gallery or something. The uh, the uh, the piers, the columns just rise up, and then uh, the uh, ribs spring, and the arches spring directly from the top of the columns. And here you also see these tall lancet windows. And they are called lancet because, uh, of course, a, a lancet is a is a, a, a sharp tool that you're dissecting with and things like this. Um, and this reminds people, I guess, of that. Um, it is a slender, pointed, arched window. So you've got your pointed arch, and it's very slender and very vertical. Uh, it's also known as the Trinity Chapel, so it's, it has two dedications. And here we're looking up, uh, seeing the effect of these uh, piers, which are, as you can see, compound. They have all the little shafts on them there, so uh, completely cover the uh, heavier structure and just rise up uh, very vertically, very slender, to the springing of the vault. And then uh, the ribs uh, and the arches uh, in a form a decorative pattern on the ceiling. Within Salisbury Cathedral, um, there is also, uh, a little bit later, uh, but still within the 13th century, uh, 1275 to 1284, uh, the Cathedral Chapter House. Now the Chapter House is the uh, room in which the monks would meet for meetings and um, uh, chapter business. <laughs> This is in the decorated style. So you have the lancet or early Gothic style. And here we have uh, the slightly later, which might correspond to high Gothic, um, decorated style. And as you can see, the ribs are forming a pattern in the ceiling. And you have this one central uh, compound here that rise, all of the uh, slender colonnettes rise up and it's almost as though they're turning into ribs, uh, sort of like a, a, a kind of fountain spraying water, only here they're spraying ribs <laughs> uh, with a, just a beautiful decorative pattern. Windows fill most of the wall. So at the bottom you have a blind arcade in the lower wall and then you have the, um, the entire <laughs> upper part of the wall uh, filled with windows. They are very large windows composed of a circular rose at the pinnacle of a pointed arch. And then within that large pointed arch, it's subdivided into two arches with four lobed circular design at the top subdivided into two arches with four lobed circular design at the top uh, that surmounts the lancet windows. So within the large arch you have four lancet windows uh, that they're subdivided into two uh, smaller arches each with two lancet windows. You're probably all familiar with Westminster Abbey in London. Uh, it's associated with the royal family uh, and uh, royal weddings, and all sorts of pageantry takes place in Westminster Abbey. Uh, this church is actually contemporary to Saint Chapelle, but of course it's much larger in scale. Although, uh, like Saint Chapelle, it is associated with the royal family, in this case, the royal family of England. Uh, with Saint Chapelle, the French royal family. Um, Henry the Third, King Henry the uh, Third, ordered this church built uh, in order to house the shrine of Saint Edward the Confessor, who was uh, an English king who was also a saint. Uh, He was very impressed by the French Gothic style of his time, so he hired a French master mason uh, named Henri, or Henry de Reims, R-E-Y-E-N-S. That's Henry or Henri, if you want to do it in French, uh, which is Henry with an I instead of a Y, uh, and then D-E-R-E-Y-N-E-S. 
And this church forms a kind of transition between the English lancet style and the decorated style. Look at the plan. You'll see that there is a French chevet or choir at the eastern end with a polygonal apse, an ambulatory, and radiating chapels. Uh, this was the first French chevet in England rather than those uh, rectilinear apses uh, that we've seen earlier. The church itself has a three-part elevation that we're familiar with now with the arcade, the gallery, and then the Clare story. Um, but unlike some of the churches we've looked at before, it's very high and narrow. It's 103 feet high. So here you see the three elevations and you see the vaulting. Uh, this is a wonderful example of ridge rib vaulting in which this uh, long rib extends the length of the nave at the pinnacle of the vault and all of the ribs, the tercerons, uh, spring from the capital, as you can see, high up at the spring of the vault uh, and spread out fan out from the springing to the rib ridge. Now, since we're in Westminster Abbey, I decided to go and show you something that isn't actually in your text, but uh, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, this is in the, the far eastern end. Uh, this is the chapel of Henry VII, who had it built. Um, and the building continues into the early 16th century. So when I said that the Gothic style extends even into the 16th century, this is what I was thinking of. Uh, and it also is probably the most decorated vault with what we call pendant fan vaulting. And uh, I want to show this to you. This is, it's it's very beautiful. Uh, it is completely decorative uh, and the stone is carved and it really almost looks like lace patterns. Uh, we'll be talking about fan vaulting uh, and the reason this is pendant is you can see that there are these kind of cones uh, that hang down and you also have the uh, diagram that shows you the transverse arches and how, how all of this sort of false ceiling is constructed uh, on top of those arches and uh, pretty much obscuring them. And then you have all of this lace-like decorative carving. Uh, and this is English pendant fan vaulting, and this is sort of the ultimate of the uh, English love for decoration in their Gothic vaults. This is the Church of St. Andrews in Wells. It's Wells Cathedral. It's begun after uh, 1184 and it was consecrated in 1239. It was built uh, for Bishop Reginald, who was, uh, whose dates are 1174 to 1191, when he was the bishop. And this is one of those churches that I think it's, it's uh, fairly easy to recognize, uh, both the facade and as we'll see, particularly the interior. Um, the facade has, is very rich, uh, not only with the arcades, but also with the sculpture within each of these uh, uh, niches uh, that have uh, arches above them. It's uh, 147 feet high. It has six huge buttresses with these massive tow two towers, and is uh, as we said widely uh, and is richly embellished with the surface pattern and with the uh, sculptural friezes, which seem to uh, go across the building, sort of in and out and in and out. Uh, the choir was then rebuilt in the 14th century. Uh, the towers are the uh, the towers are from the uh, 14th and 15th century, English perpendicular, that's the top of the towers there. Uh, the nave vault is quite low. It's only 64 feet high, which is actually lower than the side aisles of the tallest French cathedrals. 
The walls are thick, there are low proportions, and small lancet windows. There's no flying buttresses. There's the emphasis on the horizontal because you have no vertical elements uh, dividing the, ch the church into bays, no, no uh, colonnettes going up the wall. And here we have a triforium, but it's a fairly large one, uh, that continues in a kind of zigzag pattern uh, as a, as a hor horizontal uh, decorative element down the entire uh, church, down the entire nave. But they have this very interesting and very unique arches that support the crossing tower. And these are known as strainer arches or scissor arches. A strainer arch or a scissor arch, uh, you can see how this is essentially two arches, one extending down to the point of the one that extends up. And it does remind you a little bit about the uh, about scissors that uh, you know cross over. It was built in 1338, and the choir itself was rebuilt in the 14th century. Now, why did they put something like this in? Well, it wasn't purely decorative, although it certainly is decorative as well. Um, it was built to support the tower because the masonry had been cracking. So they had to put a support in. And this is what they came up with. It's essentially four pairs of inverted arches on all the sides of the crossing. We're only seeing here, of course, the nave side. And uh, then this becomes uh, the entrance into the choir. And here you see the plan uh, with the earlier part of the church and the uh, the uh, area of the crossing which has uh, the strainer arches and then it's almost like a, a completely uh, I want to say almost like another church uh, with the very very decorative patterns behind this uh, and you can also see this uh, polygonal shape on your plant over on the left uh, this is the chapter house here in the easternmost choir you're seeing the decorative uh, patterns of the of the ribs and then we're going to go into the chapter house which is it's again exquisite uh, surprising <laughs> I think kind of elegant uh, in the use of the ribs um, you have the you have the columns or the piers that support the roof of the chapter house and uh, all of these uh, shafts these little narrow thin uh, colonnettes or shafts uh, on the uh, pier that obscure its uh, the weight and thickness and then they seem to turn into ribs uh, you have the uh, ribs just um, reaching up to the ceiling and crossing over and they are combined with the extra ribs the lune uh, to create a star-shaped pattern on the vault So here you can see. Gloucester Cathedral of the 14th century, 1352 to 57. Gloucester Cathedral exemplifies the perpendicular style with the huge east window of the choir that stretches from the floor to the vault supported by a vertical grid of stone. And you can see why it's called the rectilinear style, because you do certainly have this window uh, subdivided into uh, rectangular shapes that then have arches within uh, the rectangles, within the oblongs. Um, and so having this entire wall of window is very characteristic of the late Gothic or perpendicular style in, the, uh, in England. The choir vault, which dates from 1332 to 1357, is covered with a myriad of small ribs, the Lerne ribs, that connect the tercerons, these are the ribs that rise up from the springing of the vault, and the rib ridges down the center, and together they form a web-like pattern, uh, showing you the English love of uh, decoration and pattern. When we enter the cloister at Gloucester Cathedral, we see 
uh, the exemplification of the English perpendicular fan vault. Now, this is the South Cloister, and it was, uh, it was erected between 1370 and 1377, so late 14th century. The fan vault consists of concave, half-cone-shaped corbels that form flat patterns along the crown of the vault. So you can see, as you look at the springing, it almost looks like a, a half of cone. And then as you get up to the vault, instead of seeing a point, uh, it's, it's covered up with this uh, a flatter shape, just, just filled with pattern. Um, these are carved with decorative tracery that gives a lace-like appearance. And the fan vaults mask the actual structure of the vault with ornamental patterning. Uh, the English are just not as interested in showing uh, the function and the structure as they are in showing uh, this uh, beautiful decorative patterning. Another example of fan vaulting is found at Cambridge University in King's College Chapel which dates from the mid-15th uh, into the 16th century, 1446 to 1515. And this exemplifies the fully developed perpendicular style. It was designed by Reginald Eli and John Waistel, that's E-L-Y and W-A-S-T-E-L-L, -L, with vertical stone elements that support the huge windows that make up the flat walls of this rectangular hall. And you can see uh, there is an elaborate fan vault that covers the ceiling with intricate tracery that decorates the cones that uh, rise up to the center of the church vault. Incidentally, I should mention this, in the United States, when they built universities, one of the favored styles was the English perpendicular style because it had, um, what can I say, nuances, reminiscence of Oxford University, Cambridge University. So you have buildings, um, you, have, you have universities such as Princeton and uh, my alma mater, uh, Bryn Mawr. <laughs> Uh, that are in the English perpendicular style. And we do have in, in Taylor Hall a room with these very high windows. Um, I don't believe there was any fan vaulting, however. Here's the diagram that shows you how to build a fan vault. Uh, you start, of course, with your structural vault, your pointed archers, your gables, and then you cover them up. Uh, you start uh, building these cone shapes which of course, as you can see, are richly patterned. And then you cover uh, the seal, the ridge, the top of the ceiling, uh, and then adding the decorative bosses. And you get something that looks like this. It's as though your whole ceiling is covered with lace fans and exemplifies the English love of decoration.